Hello, and welcome to today's briefing on private equities, climate risks, co-hosted by the Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund and Private Equity Stakeholder Project. My name is Riddhi Mithanegabauer, and I am the Climate Research Director with the Private Equity Stakeholder Project, joining today's call from Duwamish and other Coast Salish people's land, past and present, also known as Seattle, Washington. Hi, and my name is Oscar Valdez. I'm a research manager at Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund. I'm calling from occupied Nacochtank and Agostan Biscatawai land, also known as Washington, D.C. To get us started, uh, we ask that you share your name and where you're joining us from in the chat box. And uh, please note that tonight's briefing is being live streamed. We encourage folks to share the live stream with colleagues and friends by sharing the link in the chat box and by uh, following at Real Bank Reform on Twitter. And today, Oscar and I will provide an overview of the private equity climate scorecards findings, followed by Alex Martin, Senior Policy Analyst of Climate Finance at Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund, who will share the five climate demands. From there, we will hear remarks from some of the endorsers of the scorecard, Erica Thee Patterson, Campaign Director on Climate and Environmental Justice at Action Center on Race and the Economy, and Amy Gray, Senior Climate Finance Strategist at Stand.Earth. Following remarks from, our, from endorsers, Amanda Mendoza, Climate Research and Campaign Coordinator with the Private Equity Stakeholder Project, will walk us through a call to action. We will round out the briefing with questions that we often receive from the public. But before we dive into today's event, I would like to turn it over to Amanda, who will be sharing a few remarks about the scorecard endorsers. Amanda, I'm sorry, you might be muted. Thank you, sorry about that. I'm Amanda Mendoza. Uh, speaking to you today from Ahashiman and Tongva land, also known as Orange County, California. Record heat waves have plummeted much of the country this summer, stressing the power grid and threatening worker safety. Heavy rains have led to dangerous flooding in places like Kentucky, California, and Jackson, Mississippi, where damage left thousands of residents without access to clean and safe drinking water. The evidence is irrefutable that climate change is here and it's a global crisis. Human lives have been drastically affected, particularly those of indigenous and frontline communities, and the land in every state, including our national parks, is in danger. Mitigating the impacts of climate change, especially on frontline communities, is absolutely essential. The private equity climate risk scorecard and demands provide another step towards accountability of some of the worst private equity actors and highlights a clear pathway towards a just energy transition. The development of the scorecard and demands were a collaborative effort and many organizations provided feedback and input from various viewpoints, including frontline community expertise and financial and investor engagement expertise as, long, as well as climate science. The new scorecard and report is the foundation for a national coalition of supporters who are demanding that financial institutions that are propelling our climate crisis must act in a responsible and, account and accountable way. We are tremendously thankful to all the individuals who offered input and are proud to share that 11 influential organizations endorse the scorecard. Thank you to our endorsers, Action Center on Race and the Economy, mm -hmm. Climate Finance Action, Food and Water Watch, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, Little Sis, Natural Resources Defense Council, Public Citizen, Sierra Club, Stand Earth, and the Sunrise Project. We couldn't have done it without you. Now I'd like to turn back over to Riddhi. Thank you, Amanda, and to all of, our, all of our endorsers. As Amanda suggested, there is no doubt that we are in the midst of an alarming climate crisis, one that is fueled by the extraction, production, and transportation of fossil fuels. Private equity is a major investor in the climate crisis. Eight of the largest private equity firms in the world oversee $216 billion in energy assets, an amount similar to the fossil fuel financing by the world's top five banks from just last year. Using the retirement funds of millions of workers, including teachers, nurses, and firefighters, 
in public service jobs, private equity exposes the retirement savings of ordinary people to the climate and financial risks associated with fossil fuels. With our research partners, Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund, we have put together a scorecard that assesses the climate risks and climate commitments of eight large private equity buyout firms. But first, what is private equity and how does this industry affect our climate? Private equity firms pool large sums of capital from institutional investors such as public pension funds, and they invest in companies in our economy, including those throughout the energy supply chain, chain in such as fracked gas, offshore drilling, LNG terminals, pipelines, coal and gas plants in North America and beyond. As the name implies, these investments are largely private and thus are not subject to much public or regulatory scrutiny. In fact, generally speaking, private equity owned companies can choose what types of information that they'd like to share with the public, including investors, and they can say different things to different people. Aside from using large sums of other people's money, private equity firms also employ large amounts of debt to acquire companies. Together, these streams of debt and equity enable private equity firms to buy fossil fuel assets from public companies. So for example, as ExxonMobil, Occidental Petroleum, ConocoPhillips sell off oil fields, private equity has repeatedly stepped up to buy them and keep drilling, thereby shifting polluting assets away from public and regulatory scrutiny. And because of the lack of regulation of private markets, many blind spots arise around the hazards these firms pose to investors' funds and workers' retirement accounts. At the end of the day, though, the people who face the most significant costs of continued investment in fossil fuels and the accompanying climate crisis are frontline communities and stakeholders who must contend with the environmental harm associated with private equity's ownership of fossil fuels. Structural racism and systemic inequalities are woven throughout our climate emergency, and those who bear the greatest toxic burdens end up being low-income communities and communities of color. Due to the lack of standardized reporting requirements in private markets, investors, regulators, and the public cannot compare the firm's climate risks or climate commitments apples to apples, so to speak. This is a huge problem and underscores how the private equity climate scorecard can play an important role in providing concise information about private equity's energy exposure, as well as an assessment of each firm's commitment towards a clean energy future. Greater standardized disclosure will serve to facilitate accountability and encourage a rapid transition away from the climate and financial risks associated with fossil fuels. Now I'd like to turn it over to Oscar to discuss the findings surrounding the scorecard and the firm's fossil fuel portfolios. Thank you, Riti. So research done by AFR and private equity stakeholder project, uh, as well as others, uh, has uncovered a number of metrics allowing us to better understand the impact of private equity firms investments in the energy sector, and in particular, in, the fo in fossil fuels. For the scorecard, we developed a methodology for a composite measure that collapses several of those metrics, a combination of quantitative and qualitative indicators into a single score by each private equity firm. The indicators we're using are the, numbers of, the number of fossil fuel companies in the private equity firm's portfolio, the percent, uh, percentage of uh, their investments that is in fossil fuels versus renewables, the emissions from their power plants, and their compliance with our set of demands for alignment with uh, science-based targets and for transparency. The indicators were uh, normalized, uh, which is transforming to a same scale because they were expressing different units like percentage versus metric tons versus numbers of units. And that way we can uh, compare apple to apples after the normalization. We also weighted uh, the indicators and aggregated them into a final score. This uh, process allows us to uh, simplify some of the complexity of all the information uh, and allows us to rank these companies on a similar scale. The eight private equity firms in the scorecard are the Carlyle Group, Warburg uh, Pincus, KKR, Brookfield, Aris, Apollo, Blackstone, and TPG. As you can see in the image, the Carlyle Group uh, was ranked the worst and Warburg, Pincus, and KKR also joined Carlyle as the top three offenders on climate among this uh, group of private equity firms. Carlyle, uh, as I said, ranked last among its peers and earning an F. Uh, Carlyle continues to demonstrate inadequate 
uh, product progress toward transitioning away from fossil fuels and reducing climate risk. In 2020, for example, Carlisle-owned power plants emitted an estimated 10.8 million metric tons of carbon dioxide, which is uh, more than two thirds of their energy portfolio. Um, sorry, and more than two thirds of their ener energy portfolio uh, are fossil fuel companies. We were able to track the power plants owned by these companies using data from the Energy Information Administration, and we found that power plants financed by Carlisle, Aris, Apollo, and Blackstone combined emitted 41 million metric tons of CO2 in 2020, which is more than the entire country of Portugal. Firms earning a D score include Warburg Pincus, KKR, Brookfield, Aris, Apollo, and Blackstone, and the firm, uh, private equity firm TPG earned a B, which comparably with a comparably smaller portfolio of fossil fuels and some pro progress relative to its peers uh, towards an en a clean en energy transition. I now uh, would like to turn it over to Alex, who will walk us through the report's climate demands. Thanks, Oscar. Um, as PE firms continue to play a larger and larger role in financing our energy system and thus determining our energy mix as a country, it's critical that they undertake a swift and equitable transition away from fossil fuels and toward clean energy in line with science-based targets that can limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. What that will take is analyzing and setting emissions targets, assessing fossil fuel energy asset impairment and retiring assets on a swift timeline, ensuring a just and equitable transition for local communities and their workforce, and to ensure accountability through all this, there needs to be adequate disclosure of all of these items and more. With that, um, I'll start with our five demands that PE firms uh, must meet to do so. First, Number one, they need to align with science-based climate targets to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. What it will take to do that includes a couple sub points. They need to immediately cease investments in fossil fuel expansion. The International Energy Agency Net Zero by 2050 report, which came out recently, found that to hit 1.5 degrees Celsius or less of warming, there is a need for no new oil and gas fields beyond those already under development. So any new oil and gas that's uh, produced right now or explored for and produced will either become stranded assets or push us beyond a safe climate threshold of 1.5 C. Next, they need to cease gas flaring and venting by 2025. Uh, they need to achieve a fossil free energy portfolio by 2030. And this is made all the more possible uh, because private equity firms hold on to companies for relatively short time periods. Uh, and lastly, to align with a 1.5 uh, C future, they need to retire fossil fuel energy assets uh, by 2030. Next on our set of demands, they need to disclose fossil fuel exposure, emissions, and impacts so that investors and the public understand the risks they face and the impacts that they're creating. So this would include disclosing all fossil fuel assets and financial estimates and assumptions regarding asset impairment. This means the expected future cash flows uh, and what they can expect to recoup from those investments, also including asset retirement obligations. As long as those things are accurate, then we know that they have a, an accurate financial picture of uh, their, their own future finances. And next, they need to disclose all direct and indirect emissions and climate-related community impacts. The third demand uh, is about reporting a portfolio-wide energy transition plan. First, they need to disclose a portfolio-wide climate transition plan, uh, disclose the role of voluntary carbon offsets immediately and cease their utiliz utilization by 2025. We know now that there are major integrity problems that exist within the voluntary carbon offset markets, and they just can't be relied upon to offset emissions right now. So what we need first and foremost are true emissions reductions and, um, and ceasing use of those products uh, unless and until the integrity improves. They should disclose the use of carbon removal, carbon utilization and storage, and related technologies. And they should disclose comprehensive analyses under various climate warming scenarios and decarbonization timelines. Um, they'll get a lot of help with this. A lot of financial groups like the Network for Greening the Financial System and the Federal Reserve are working right now on scenario analysis tools and uh, climate related scenarios that financial institutions and investment firms can use to test their resilience and manage forward-looking climate risk. 
Fourth, they need to integrate climate and environmental justice into their plans. This would mean establishing robust due diligence, verification, and grievance redress mechanisms to ensure that all human rights and land rights are respected, to require all portfolio companies to adopt no, uh, no deforestation, no peat, and no exploitation policies, and last, to de develop a just transition program uh, for impacted communities and workers. The last prong of our demand set is about the impact that these firms have on our political system. So we'd like uh, firms to commit to providing transparency on political spending and climate lobbying. Um, to do this, they'd need to disclose political spending and climbing, climate lobbying at the asset manager, portfolio company, and trade association level. They'd also need to provide transparency on alignment with global standards on responsible corporate climate lobbying. This is about making sure that the actions that these firms uh, are, are uh, actually doing in the lobbying space align with um, their, their stated intentions. Now I'd like to turn it over to one of the endorsers of the scorecard, Erica, uh, with the Action Center on Race and the Economy. Thanks so much, Alex, and hi, everyone. So grateful to be part of this launch. I'm joining you from occupied Tongva land in so-called Los Angeles. And yeah, let me just start by saying a big thank you to everyone at Americans for Financial Reform's Education Fund and Private Equity Stakeholder Project for all of the incredible work that went into launching this private equity uh, climate risk scorecard. It's truly coming at such a critical moment. Uh, I'd say for too long, private equity giants have gotten away with profiteering off of climate chaos and environmental racism by investing in fossil fuel corporations that spew toxic air pollutants into frontline communities and accelerate climate change. This is a massive environmental justice issue. Private equity groups like Carlyle Group and KKR finance oil and gas pipelines, coal plants, and offshore drilling sites linked to all kinds of indigenous land violations. Private equity is also no stranger to investing in harmful corporations or sacrificing communities of color and poor communities for short-term profits. And while in recent years, we've seen private equity firms uh, destroy hundreds of thousands of jobs in retail and healthcare sectors and watch them buy up carceral companies that extract millions of dollars from families of incarcerated individuals, uh, they've largely um, evaded scrutiny, while uh, Wall Street banks and asset managers have faced increased pressure in recent years to stop bankrolling climate catastrophe, environmental injustices, and other harmful activities. As Riddy mentioned, private equity firms are exempt from most public disclosure rules, and that is why Acre enthusiastically endorses this private equity climate scorecard and demands. Uh, private equity needs to own up to its dirty deals, clean up its act, and repair the harm it's inflicted on frontline communities who shoulder the brunt of toxic emissions and fossil fuel-driven climate disaster. The scorecard and the demands are an important set of tools that can help our movement hold private equity accountable for wreaking havoc on our communities and to win a rapid transition out of extractive and polluting industries that accelerate climate chaos and threaten uh, black, brown, and indigenous communities with climate change induced financial shocks. So thanks so much for including Acre in this launch today, super exciting. And um, now I'm gonna pass it off to one of the other endorsers, uh, Amy at stand.earth. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to be here this afternoon and very excited to see all of you. Um, thank you, Erica. Um, also, a huge thank you to Private Equity Stakeholder Project and Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund for the amazing report and, sco and scorecard. This is groundbreaking research. Um, as someone who coordinates and supports the Climate Safe Pensions Network, um, a network of about 25 grassroots campaigns who are working hard on divesting pension funds from investments in fossil fuels, to reinvesting in climate solutions. This report is not only a huge resource for grassroots organizers, but sheds light on the private equity firms and the money invested in climate destruction. The fact that private markets hold billions in the fossil fuel industry with minimal public visibility is appalling. 
investing in climate destruction, violations of indigenous sovereignty, and massive fossil fuel infrastructure projects that destroy frontline communities in the midst of the climate crisis with no accountability is a moral failure. To date, over 1,500 institutions wrapping more than 40 trillion in assets have committed to, to divest from fossil fuels. You can check this out at divestmentdatabase.org to learn more. Yet in some cases, private equity has been the dirty last resort, scooping up these shedded toxic holdings. This first of its kind scorecard is a key accountability tool that highlights the role and responsibility of private equity ending fossil fuel finance once and for all. Divestment from fossil fuel companies is an investment in our future. Our planet just can't afford any more stalling tactics. Frontline communities just can't wait for these private equity firms to appease the fossil fuel industry while our homes burn and flood, while our bodies are polluted and our children's futures are destroyed for profit. This is why Stand absolutely supports and endorses the private equity scorecard and the demands. It's time to set the standard for the industry and stop the financing of fossil fuels now. Private equity firms who own fossil fuel assets must develop portfolio-wide climate transition plans immediately. Um, and now I'm going to turn it back over. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to turn it back over to um, Amanda from Private Equity Stakeholder Project for calls to action. Thank you, Amy and Erica, for joining us today and sharing those important remarks. We're so grateful for your contributions to this project and to the whole movement, really. Um, now I wanted to take a moment to thank the many grassroots organizations and frontline communities that have been leading the way when it comes to climate action. Not only do many of these communities bear some of the harshest impacts of climate chaos, many of them are also first in line to fight for meaningful change. The climate crisis is here, and we really must join together to hold some of these biggest contributors accountable. There are always avenues for you to get involved in whatever way is most comfortable for you. Earlier today, Extinction Rebellion, SF Bay, Oil and Gas Action Network, and the Sunrise Movement in San Francisco brought the message of private equities climate risks to an investor conference, and I'm happy to be able to share some of the photos from that action. As we speak, activists from Extinction Rebellion, New York Communities for Change, Seeding Sovereignty, and Sunrise Kids, affiliates of the Sunrise Movement, are in New York City with banners and leaflets at a separate investor conference, highlighting the impacts that private equity for firms have on their own investments and the communities grossly affected by the climate crisis. There are a couple of ways where you can participate right now. Go to peclimaterisk.org sign up for more information and follow the campaign. Please click the link to the website in the chat box to do so. You can also follow Private Equity Stakeholder Project, America's for Financial Reform Education Fund, Action Center on Race and the Economy, and Stand.Earth on social media to support our work and uplift the report. And please reach out to any of the endorsing organizations if you wanna join the on the ground or investor engagement efforts. Thank you so much for your for your support. Now back to Ruthie. Thanks, thanks Amanda for sharing the excellent call to action. Uh, we'd now like to use the remaining time to address and answer three common questions that we often receive around private equity. So the first question goes to Oscar and Alex. Uh, why don't we know too much about private equity firms and why is it so hard to find out information about them? Yeah, I think I'll take this. Thanks for the question, Riti. Um, The short answer is that private investment funds and companies have way less regulatory oversight than public investment funds and companies. And this means they're often able to operate in the dark, away from oversight of the regulators, the public, and their investors, who all really stand to lose a lot if the firms don't take climate change seriously, and if they don't begin to transition to net zero emissions, though some of them have claimed to without much progress. In the past, the public markets were the main place where capital from investors was raised, and policymakers worked hard to create adequate rules and oversight to ensure relatively safe and transparent public markets. These markets needed to feature adequate disclosure of risks and rights for shareholders so that investors and other stakeholders and the public were able to protect themselves from risks and so that the markets were fair, efficient, and free of fraud. Now, private equity firms and other types of private funds like hedge funds have become financial behemoths 
rivaled, rivaling and recently surpassing the size of the public market. But policymakers haven't yet responded to this meteoric growth by extending the rules of the road to make sure that private markets are just as safe uh, for investors as, and the public. And Wall Street has learned really quickly how to capitalize on these regulatory gaps to extract maximum profits with very limited disclosure and rights granted to shareholders. I'll give one real world example of this regulatory gap and that's come up recently in my policy area of work, which is climate related risk. The Securities and Exchange Commission recently proposed rules requiring all public companies and many investment funds of public securities to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions so that investors and the public can compare companies and investment funds, hold them accountable for their lofty climate commitments, and to make sure they're dealing with the financial risk that comes from new clean energy technologies and new climate legislation like the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act. Now, disclosure of greenhouse gas emissions is a common sense measure that the majority of investors say that they really need to accurate, for accurate valuation of securities of different companies. Uh, the problem is there's a major private equity loophole in the rule. That, uh, that means private equity firms and their funds are excluded from greenhouse gas emissions reporting, except for a few firms which also raise money in the public market. That means, um, again, we're going to be stuck with an incomplete data set. Private equity firms will continue to receive undue advantage from regulatory gaps, uh, and investors in the public will be left holding the bag from their risky investments. Um, that seems to be a, a growing pattern. So I'll kick it over to Oscar to talk about the challenges brought on by this lack of disclosure and what it means for being able to hold firms accountable. Thank you, Alex. Um, so yeah, whenever we are researching private equity, we frequently find ourselves in the dark. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to get the data right uh, and make our recommendations based on good quality information. But there is always another layer we don't know about when it comes to private equity. That tells me that private equity actively looks for ways to stay in the dark where we can't see them. They raise their companies in places where ownership isn't disclosed, they reveal very little about their ongoing operations. For them, opacity seems to be a preference and not an accident. Private equity firms thrive by staying out of the regulatory spotlight and operating in the margins of the financial regulatory framework. So um, to, a large, to a large extent, uh, that's intentional, which means that they get to frame their own story a lot of the time and construct their own narratives uh, around the impact of their investments clouding investors and the public perspective. For example, uh, private equity firms can choose, you know, they don't have to do a lot of uh, public disclosures. Uh, they are not mandated to a lot of public disclosures, but, you know, they can choose what uh, they publicly tout uh, on their website. So they can choose their green investments, but not to mention their dirty fossil fuel assets, for example. Uh, if you are doing, doing something that as it's becoming more evident, has no positive net benefits for society, except for a very small group of very, very rich Wall Street investors, then you probably don't want it advertised. So I think that's uh, our answer to your question, Brady. And uh, mm -hmm. now I uh, would like to ask you, well, another of the common questions that we are generally asked and that's uh, why are private equity firms drawn to purchasing fossil fuel assets, despite their no known risks to climate and investors? And in other words, what's their incentive? Sure, um, I guess private equity is just a higher risk asset class and its business model is to buy companies and sell them in just a few years. On average, it's usually three to five years, which means that they're not incentivized to think about long-term consequences. Moreover, much of the of the equity that private equity firms use to buy these fossil fuel companies comes from institutional investors like public pension funds or university endowments. And private equity firms also use a lot of debt or leverage. Thus, the private equity firms themselves have very little of their own skin in the game. But creditors, investors, frontline communities, and other stakeholders have much more at stake. So with that, I'd like to ask Oscar the third and final question that we are typically asked. Are private equity firms currently buying up fossil fuel assets given what we know about climate change and everything? Yes, they are. Uh, there have been uh, hundreds of deals of power plants 
over the last two years, including several major purchases of polluting assets that were pro uh, previously owned by polygly traded companies in the US. Private equity firms have acquired plants from utilities also, seeking, utilities seeking to reduce their own emissions, but the plants keep operating under the private equity ownership. Uh, for example, the private equity firm Arclight Capital Partners acquired a portfolio of 13 natural gas fired plants that produce so, uh, somewhere over 6,000 megawatts of electricity. And they acquired that from the Public Service Enterprise Group, one of New Jersey's largest utilities. So while the public utility reduced its emission, emissions uh, and touts its evolution, quote unquote, as a clean energy company to investors and to consumers, the 13 plants, which are spread through New Jersey, Connecticut, Maryland, and New York, will continue operating and polluting under Arclight's uh, ownership. New uh, private equity finance gas plants like Ari's Management Hilltop Energy in Pennsylvania went online in 2021, and others like uh, CPV Three Rivers Energy in Illinois will soon fire up. Private equity owner uh, owned power plants uh, spewed an estimated 200 million metric tons of carbon dioxide annually. If it were a country, U.S. private equity firms' uh, emissions would rank 31st uh, among all countries' CO2 emissions, right behind Spain and ahead, ahead of Argentina. And I would also add that uh, private equity firms are also providing critical financing to revive retired plants and build new uh, plants, uh, expanding the fossil fuel footprint and climate emissions and logging in decades, decades of uh, more pollution. And uh, we have seen, for example, in upstate New York, where a private equity firm acquired a retired coal plant and turned it into a natural gas burning plant that uh, now powers Bitcoin mining instead of homes, which you know often yields rising local electricity price for ratepayers while Bitcoin profits uh, you know, are uh, transmitted instantly to faraway speculators. So in addition to those power plants, the private equity firms in the scorecard continue to buy uh, oil and gas assets. Warburg, Pincus, portfolio companies have bought up tens of thousands of acres of drilling. KKR entering a new $9 billion natural gas pipeline deal. Oak Tree has joined uh, a joint venture with one of the nation's dirtiest gas drill drillers. And together they keep buying more wells. And Brookfield bought a 7 billion Canadian tar sands pipeline last year. Thanks, Oscar. Um, I, I know that I learned a lot and I'm continuing to learn more about private equities, climate risks, and I'm certain that folks joining today's briefing have, have as well. Um, on behalf of Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund and Private Equity Stakeholder Project, we thank you for attending today's briefing on private equity climate risks and thank our endorsers and guest speakers, Alex, Amanda, Amy, and Erica for joining us today. Thank you, Riti. And uh, to all of you, please stay tuned for more updates by following us on Twitter at Real Bank Reform and at PE Stakeholder. Also, please be sure to visit peclimaterisks.org to check out the scorecard and with even more research and content to come in the future. Thank you, everyone.